Welcome back, students. Welcome back to Corbett Report University. I'm your professor, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 11th day of July 2022, and I'm coming from the sunny, beautiful climes of Western Japan, as usual. You are tuned into episode 420 of the Corbett Report podcast, Mass Media, a History. All right, class, pop quiz. Don't worry, it's an easy one today. My question for you today is, how much time have you spent today in mediated reality? I'll give you a second to think about your response to that question because, spoiler, I, I'm not in the room with you right now. I, I can't hear your response. I'm not looking at you. We're not really having a conversation. You are watching a media production. So I can't actually hear your response. Um, something that I know I don't need to po point out, but I think I do actually, because I think pointing that out speaks to the extent to which we have naturalized, normalized, internalized the process of media consumption, that we don't even stop to really contemplate consciously the fact that we are hearing this disembodied voice from afar of some recorded image of someone, we feel as human beings, we generally tend to feel when we're absorbed, our attention is absorbed in an audiovisual representation, we tend to subconsciously start to feel like we are in a conversation with someone. You feel like you know me as a human being, even if you've never met me, never seen me in real life. That is the power of media. And I think that speaks to the importance of the question which I just asked you, which let me remind you of the question, because this is not a rhetorical question. It is a real question that will have a very real specific answer for you. And I want you to think about your answer to this question. How much time have you spent today in mediated reality? Now, I guess the first way, the first way we approach a question like that and the first thing we should think about is, okay, so what, what do you mean by that? What is mediated reality? What is media? What is mediated reality? Well, let's, let's define it in its broadest possible sense. Anything that is not direct personal, lived, real-world experience coming from real other people actually physically present in the same location as you or events that are taking place in your visual audio proximity is mediated reality. So anyone that you've chatted to today via messages or with some social media app or what have you, that's mediated reality, obviously. Uh, anyone that you've phoned, talk to on a phone today, mediated reality. Anything that you obviously you watch television, you, you, you stream some Netflix, whatever, whatever the case may be, all of that, of course, media. Um, all right, how about uh, read a book today? Media, media. Absolutely all of these different experiences that we have that are various ways that people are communicating to us from afar. That's all media. That's all mediated reality, not real world reality. And your answer to this question, if you are like most people these days, I mean, you're engaged in a media experience right now as I am as I am speaking these words? No, as you are listening to these words, more to the point. That's a mediated experience. So you've spent some time in media today. How much time? Is it more time than you have spent in actual real world reality? Talking to real human beings face to face in the same physical location as you? Quite possibly, yes possibly the majority of your time today has been spent in mediated experience. Maybe even all of your time today has been spent in mediated experience. At any rate, that is where we're heading. And the obvious question that that provokes, I believe, is uh, what does that mean? What does that mean for the future of humanity that we are going into more and more and more and more and more mediated experience and less and less and less real world experience. Now, I hope if I have uh, brought brought out the right audience for, for the type of uh, person that I am and the things that I think about, I hope you are intrigued by this question and the possibilities, the sort of Pandora's box that this seemingly simple question opens. And if you are the type of person that's intrigued by this line of thought, then boy, do I have something for you. <laughs> Specifically, I have Mass Media, A History, which is an online course, which is now available for download from newworldnextweek.com. And uh, just to give you the overview, this is a six plus hour lecture series divided into three lessons. 
uh, in which you, when you purchase this from newworldnextweek.com, you will receive the audio and video of each of the three lessons, a complete hyperlinked transcript of the course, a study guide, and the slideshow presentation that I use in the online course. You, you can get the slides as well as part of that digital download. So that amounts to about two and a half gigabytes of data. To put that in real human experience terms, that's over six hours of lecture. The transcript alone, if you put the three lessons together, is over 100 pages of text. Single space, 12 point font text. And of course, like everything I do, completely hyperlinked. So every time I talk about a book or a video or a specific source, it is linked there in the transcript. There's the study guide, which will have summaries of the lesson, summaries of the key ideas presented in that lesson, questions for further study, and a list of all of the recommended reading from each lesson. There's a, an incredible amount of data in this online course, and it is swirling around. It is titled Mass Media, A History. But as I go on to say in the course itself, it should probably be titled something more like the past, present, and future of media, because that's really what the course covers. But rather than me trying to explain what the course covers, why don't we watch the first 10 minutes of the first lecture where I go through uh, what the course covers and start laying the groundwork for exploring this idea of mass media and history. We are here in a course called Mass Media, A History. I am your host, James Corbett. It is November 2021, and we are in lesson one, The Media Conspiracy. Um, as always, I always, 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 always want to start uh, to share my sources and my notes and all of that. So there is going to be a link for this, corbettreport.com slash massmedia. Don't go there yet. It hasn't been posted yet, but it will be shortly after we finish today. And it'll have all of the references to all of this, the specific things that I cite in this uh, course and uh, recommended reading as well. So as I said to the people who got here early, this is going to be a data dump of information. I'm going to try my best to get through it all, but we'll see how far we get today anyway. Um, get your pen and paper handy. All right, so let's start by talking about what the course is going to cover, right? Fair enough. So you might expect this is going to be names and dates and figures and places. This is a history course, right? Well, no, this is a philosophical exploration of the meaning of media. And I think this goes to the heart of what it is I do and why I do it. I'm very excited about this topic because... I think this speaks powerfully to the relationship of technology to society. How does the technology that we are using, or is it using us, structure our society? We have the relationship of media to power, an extremely important subject that I think should be, I think should be obvious to people who are uh, regular listeners of the Corbett Report. Media often speaks to power and if the last two years has taught us anything, I think it is that media can, of course, have an incredibly profound effect on shaping political discourse and political, uh, at least uh, preparing the public for various political moves. Um, we're going to talk about the question, what is the news? And people might remember if they saw, I had a video up a couple of years ago about uh, the news is a social construct. It is used to program you or something along those lines. Um, this, sound, this is one of those questions that I hope, I hope there are some people out there that go, like, what? that's a stupid question. What's the news? I don't know. I turn on the CNN or I open the newspaper or I go online and I get the news. What is the news? And where did that concept come from? How did it develop? What did it used to look like? What does it look like now? What will it look like in the future? And what do those differences mean? I think are incredibly important questions, actually. So I hope by the end of this course, you will look at that question and go, I don't know exactly, but it's probably an important question. And uh, we're going to look at the past, present, and future of media. This is called Mass Media a History. It should probably be called the past, present, and future of media because uh, we're going to we're going to look at obviously what's happening today, 
how that relates to what happened in the past and what we can expect in the future. But as always, my message is always that the, the future is not written in the stars. We are writing the history books of tomorrow with our actions today. So we have a part to play in shaping the future of media and what it will mean. And uh, I think that's a responsibility that we should take seriously because it truly will, I think, affect the ultimate course of humanity itself, not to put too big an emphasis on it. Um, so that's and those are just sort of the, the big topics that I think we'll keep coming back to throughout this course. Obviously, we're going to cover a lot of specific information, a lot of other things besides. But those are some of the big themes and questions that I want to be returning to as we continue our exploration today. I should note parenthetically that I believe uh, it was brought to my attention that um, on the sign up page, after you signed up for the course, it was uh, told you the recommended reading was uh, the public opinion by Walter Williams. <laughs> of course, that's Walter Lippmann. I hope everyone was able to suss that out. Um, and, uh, but don't worry if you haven't read it or only read bits of it. It's not necessary for you to have read it. We will be going through it here in the course. And another one that would be handy, I think, if you at least gave a perusal of would be Marshall McLuhan, Understanding Media, um, a pretty important book that we're going to be returning to at various points throughout this course. But let's keep going. This is an academic enterprise of sorts. I guess, right? So let's start by defining our terms. Always helps to define our terms. If we're going to talk about mass media, a history, what is mass media? That's the question, right? So you could start like a bad high school essay with a dictionary definition with singular or plural concord, usually with the, as in the mass media, the main means of mass communication, such as television, radio, and newspapers considered collectively. All right. I mean, so far, so straightforward. So pretty plain and boring. All right. Got it. How about a more technical definition? Science Daily. The mass media are diversified media technologies that are intended to reach a large audience by mass communication. All right. Again, pretty straightforward, pretty uncontroversial. Well, why don't we start? Why don't, why don't we get a little bit deeper into it? Maybe there's something a little bit more controversial or at least thought-provoking that we can say about what mass media actually is. Um, we could get into the academic side of it, for example. We could turn to the Chicago School of Media Theory at the University of Chicago, which has uh, an entire page up. This will be in the course notes. Again, corbettreport.com slash mass media. If you're interested in an academic discussion of the question of what is mass media, they get into it here. It starts by noting that the first recorded usages of mass media as a term was in 1923 in advertising and selling, uh, a, a journal title, I believe. Here, mass media is loosely defined as representing the most economical way of getting the story over the new and wider market in the least time. The etymology of the concept is crucial in understanding mass media as it is composed of two highly nuanced words. And if you want the academic treatment of it, you can go to that uh, uh, page at the Chicago School of Media Theory and they have a lengthy discussion drilling down what does mass mean and what does media mean and what do they mean in relation and all of that. So it's uh, if you're inclined, you can certainly check that out. But let's, again, let's get a little bit closer to the heart of it. We're going to take a look at a definition from A Free and Responsible Press, which was the title of the publication by uh, the Hutchins Commission, which ran from 1942 to 1947, uh, which we will be talking about a bit later. So I'll give you the background on that. Um, but in their final report that they issued, they said that the modern press itself is a new phenomenon. Its typical unit is the great agency of mass communication. These agencies can facilitate thought and discussion. They can stifle it. They can advance the progress of civilization, or they can thwart it. They can debase and vulgarize mankind. They can endanger the peace of the world. They can do so accidentally, in a fit of absence of mind. They can play up or down the news and its significance, foster and feed emotions, create complacent fictions and blind spots, misuse the great words and uphold empty slogans. Their scope and power are increasing every day as new instruments become available to them. These instruments can spread lies faster and farther than our forefathers dreamed when they enshrined the freedom of the press in the First Amendment to our constitution. So getting towards something that I think gets at least at the significance 
literal definition. But let's take a look at one more definition. This one, uh, the mass media serve as a system for communicating messages and symbols to the general populace. It is their function to amuse, entertain, and inform, and to inculcate individuals with the values, beliefs, and codes of behavior that will integrate them into the institutional structures of the larger society. In a world of concentrated wealth and major conflicts of class interest, to fulfill this role requires systematic propaganda. All right, that's just the first several minutes of the first lesson of this six plus hour online course. The first lesson is about two hours long. Again, it's called the media conspiracy. So I'm just in these first several minutes, I'm just setting the table to begin the actual meat and potatoes exploration of what is essentially a 450 year headlong mad dash through history from the mid 15th century and the development of the movable type printing press up until what I identify as the zenith of print uh, around the dawn of the 20th century, perhaps World War I era, where print was the primary means for most people in their daily lives to receive information about the outside world through newspapers and other printed matter before Obviously, that was eclipsed by the electronic media that were, was to come, radio and television, etc. Um, so in that 450-year scope of Lesson 1, I go through an awful lot of specific detail, and it's kind of bookended by what I call the Morgan Conspiracy and, uh, and the Gutenberg Conspiracy. And these are two specific conspiracies that took place. They're documented history. This isn't some secret thing or some speculation. It's documented history involving specific people doing specific things things at specific times, which I go into in the lesson, that I think form illustrative bookends to that era of history, which, when looked at as an era of history defined by the media technology that had come along to dominate in that era, it's fascinating, a fascinating social cultural exploration with lots and lots and lots of detail. It's difficult for me to, to give the gist of that in just a few sentences here. Um, but as I say, that, that era of the ascendance of print and printed material was to be overtaken in the 20th century, obviously, by the electronic media, specifically the advent of wireless radio and eventually commercial television. And those were incredibly uh, important developments for the development, not just of the way that information is transmitted through society, but what society thinks, the way it thinks, what it chooses to think about, the way it represents itself. Some very deep philosophical matters start to come up as we start to look at the electronic consciousness that arose in the 20th century, identified by certain philosophers and writers who some of you in the crowd might already know what I'm gesturing towards there. If not, you will find out in lesson two, which is titled TV as a Weapon. Once again, that isn't that isn't an analogy or a metaphor. That is meant in some sense, literally, TV is a weapon that was weaponized and used as a weapon against the public. And I mean that in a specific sense, talking about specific scientific research that had gone on that I go into in that lesson. Um, but I also talk about, of course, the advent of commercial radio and the social um, tool of control that radio was specifically and consciously shaped to be. Uh, I talk about that history as well. And in order to give you just, again, a brief taste of lesson two, let's play a short segment uh, near the beginning of that lesson where I talk about the precursor to the radio revolution, which was the World Wide Web. No, 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 no. Not this World Wide Web. Not the Internet World Wide Web. I mean the original World Wide Web. The web, the collection of telegraph wires that, for the first time, in a very real sense, connected humanity around the globe. The telegraph revolution, right? And we were noting at that time, the telegraph revolution was truly a revolution of a similar kind to the Gutenberg revolution, something truly transformative that was allowing language to transport in, uh, in absence of a physical medium. Almost. And of course, the almost there is the telegraph cable itself, um, which does factor into this story, obviously, as we uh, move on to the wireless revolution. But let's just dwell on that telegraph revolution a bit, because we might have given it a bit of short shrift last week in our mad long, ridiculous 450 year plunge through history. And let's just reflect on this invention and what it enabled in order to connect people who were 
the dozens, hundreds, and eventually, once they connected across the oceans, thousands of miles apart through instantaneous communication. That was not just some sort of technological revolution in some dry, dusty sense. To the people living through that revolution, this technology was magic. And in order to understand that, just take a look at some of the quotes that you get from people at that time. For example, the U.S. Secretary of State from 1852 to 1853, Edward Everett, remarking on the uh, electrification of information, essentially, although I'm sure he wouldn't have identified it as such. But he said, does it not seem all but a miracle of art that the thoughts of living men, the thoughts that we think up here on the Earth's surface in the cheerful light of day, about the markets and the exchanges and the seasons and the elections and the treaties and the wars and all the fond nothings of daily life should clothe themselves with elemental sparks and shoot with fiery speed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye from hemisphere to hemisphere. Yeah, you better believe that was a pretty remarkable thing that a lot of people were thinking about deeply at the time. Um, uh, and it was from that revolution, obviously, that we started to see uh, people, if not losing their minds, at least becoming quite um, festive at the thought of really encircling the globe with this telegraph technology. So in 1903, President Teddy Roosevelt sent a telegram message, the first telegram message that went around the world. He sent a message to himself through the cables that had been at that time linked up all the way around the world. And as noted in the book, The Network, The Battle for the Airwaves and the Birth of the Communications Age, which will be in the recommended reading list, uh, they note that after President Roosevelt's 1903 telegram made it around the earth, many commentators took a special glee in noting that 20th century science had outdone even William Shakespeare's Puck, the magic fairy who brags of being able to circle uh, the earth in 40 minutes. Teddy's telegram raced around the world three times that fast. So literally, people could not have even did not even conceive, even in their wildest flights of fantasy, something like that could really take place. But in a sense, it was. At any rate, information was moving around the earth even faster than Shakespeare dared dream. And others had similar flights of rhetorical fancy when considering this. Um, for example, the network goes on to quote uh, the, uh, the Times of London, um, the usually steadfast and very sober and very analytical Times, uh, even effused with um, rhetorical praise for the uh, the connection of the first um, or across the Atlantic telegraph wire when it was connected, I believe, in the 1860s. Um, they noted at the time, the Atlantic has dried up and we become in reality, as well as wish, one country. So that's not just rhetorical flourish. It is also a reflection of the fact um, that we will, again, be thinking about more deeply later in this lesson and, and next week, the, the fact of the growing electronic consciousness, which is international. It really does extend across the globe. And how does it do that? It does that quite literally, of course, in the telegraph wires. And these wires, this series of wires, this in particular is a map of the Eastern Telegraph Companies. Uh, telegraph uh, cables that were connected at that time in 1901. And as you see, you see they extend across the Atlantic, uh, across the Pacific. Um, they connect uh, virtually every continent, Antarctica excluded. And uh, they do um, paint what is beginning to become a World Wide Web of sorts, is it not? The telegraph wires were the, perhaps the first World Wide Web it, capable of transporting information essentially, instantaneously, um, anywhere in the world or anywhere in the world that mattered, right? Um, now, of course, this, as I say, it blew people's minds when this started to happen and it was treated like magic. This is incredible. And they started to effuse about the, you know, growing, oh, the Atlantic is dried up and all of this. But <laughs> I don't know if you have uh, seen the Louis C.K. bit about, um, uh, I think he was talking at that time about the first Wi-Fi wi hookups on international air, air, uh, airplanes and, oh, you know, you can check your mail and, you know, do uh, watch Netflix or whatever on the plane. 
And it was this brand new system that was incredible. The first time it was announced, like, oh, we have Wi-Fi on our flight today. And, and Louis C.K. talks about, well, actually, the Wi-Fi broke down during the flight. It stopped working. And the guy next to him was like, this is stupid. Oh, I can't believe this is not working. Garbage. The, the fact that people can go from, oh, my God, this is amazing. I never even dreamed this could happen to <laughs> feeling so entitled to it that they can't believe it's not working happens very quickly. And such was the case with the Telegraph wires, uh, they were in enormous feats of engineering to, I mean, imagine laying a cable across the Atlantic Ocean, not an easy task. It took several tries before they were able to lay one that even lasted for a few months, let alone one that lasted more permanently than that. Um, and they were not uh, they were not cheap to make or to maintain. Um, one Atlantic cable uh, laid, I believe, in the early 1900s cost $3.5 million dollars it required 1.4 million pounds of copper insulated with 800,000 pounds of sap from Malaysian perch trees. And it was armored with 17 million pounds of brass, iron, and jute. And even with all of that, it was still prone to sharp rocks, ships, anchors, and the teeth of curious sharks who were attracted by the electrical current throwing, flowing through the wires. So um, it was it was a, a, a fragile system, to say the least. Um, and uh, fragile in every sense. Uh, of course, that was demonstrated most notably in World War I, where in the opening hours of the war, one of the first things the Brits did was to cut the uh, telegraph cables connecting Germany to North America, and the Germans returned the favor, as it were. So telegraph cables and communication um, were fragile and, and could be tampered with and uh, it could be, become articles that would become important in wartime. So they were the, the importance of international telecommunications for national security was starting to come on in the scene and all of that. So there were a lot of concerns about telegraphs and whether they were really the final stage of this revolution. Um, not least of which because the telegraph companies from 1886 onwards operated an open cartel. They weren't even secret about it. They openly operated in a car cartel that charged a fixed rate of 25 cents per word to send messages. I believe that was cross Atlantic. Perhaps that was just a flat rate anywhere, but at any rate, 25 cents per word in an openly admitted cartels. And uh, that was, uh, I think, using 25% of the telegraph cable capacity at that time. So they certainly could have cut rates but they did not. So the public was growing uneasy about them. Governments were growing uneasy about reliance on these telegraph cables. It was the last physical link in the chain. As I said, the, um, the, the development of the telegraph sort of freed information from the physical medium of the printed page. You didn't have to transport books around, but you still at least had to transmit electricity around and you had to have these cables in order to do it. So there's still a physical link in the chain. If only someone could come along and break that physical link. Dot, dot, dot. The suspense is killing me. Don't leave me hanging. Come on, James. Did somebody come along to break that physical link in the chain? Was wireless communication technology invented? Spoiler. Yes, it was. As I go on to discuss in Lesson 2 2 in great detail, the development of the technology that would come along to break that physical link and to start the wireless revolution and all of the implications of that. Some, again, some very fascinating and important stuff. In lesson two, I go through the development of the electronic media technology, obviously through the advent of commercial radio, the advent of commercial television, and what that did, not just, again, not just to the, the media itself, not just to the way that people received information, but what that meant from a business perspective. What was the business model of these new electronic media? Where why am I going to just broadcast all of this information to anyone who can pick it up with a receiver? How am I going to make money from that? Hmm. And so you start to see the formation of new business models that, of course, come with them. Extremely capital intensive technologies like owning a radio station, owning a television station. These aren't things that can be purchased by the average person, even the average wealthy person. It requires corporate conglomerates to come come along and start creating networks and you start getting boards of directors and you start seeing fundamental changes to the structure of the media industry 
as a result of these technologies that themselves have societal implications, of course, because as I pointed out in the first few minutes of lesson one, yes, the relationship of media to power in society is one of the key focuses of this course. And you start to see how the different technologies enable different business models that imply different relationships of media to power at different times. And obviously, as I go on to talk about in lesson two, in the 20th century, electronic media is where we start to see the real media, the corporatization of the media, the formation of the media oligopoly, and the various interests behind that. And I talk about some of the specific corporate um, players in that game. I talk about some of the political players who wielded their political influence in order to gain media influence in order to gain political influence. And it's this kind of a rubberous uh, sn snake eating its own tail. And I also, of course, talk about the intelligence agencies, which are always hovering in the background or sometimes in the foreground of stories like these, the history of media being, of course, no exception. And what will any good right-thinking conspiracy realist think immediately off the top of their head when I talk about intelligence agencies and media, especially in the 20th century? You're going to talk about Operation Mockingbird, right? That's what it was called, right? There was a specific operation called Operation Mockingbird, right? And we know it from something or other, right? Well, of course, I do go through that in specific detail in Lesson 2. Again, everyone has heard about Operation Mockingbird, right? We all know that information is seeded to the media or directly conveyed through the media by intelligence agencies like the Central Intelligence Agency. And we know about this because it's been admitted to, at least partially, kind of. Now, I think it's important to note, actually, I find it interesting to note that, in fact, Operation Mockingbird was not called Operation Mockingbird. And the only thing it corresponds to is something that came out, I think, during the church committee. No, sorry, in the uh, the the release of the Family Jewels documents in 1973, um, there was mention of a Project Mockingbird that the CIA had engaged in in 1962, 1963, 63, um, that involved wiretapping two journalists in particular because they were suspected of having leaked government secrets. And that was Project Mockingbird. For some reason, this label has been now applied to sort of the general uh, idea of Central Intelligence Agency operations through the media. Um, Kerry Widler had an interesting um, short three-minute video about this uh, a few years back that I will link up in the course notes in case you want to check that out. I, I don't think it's just a semantic thing because the fact that people believe this was a specific operation, a specific project, probably leads people to believe that it was, okay, it was formulated at a specific time by specific people, and they implemented it in a certain way. And then because it was a specific thing, it was then revealed and shut down, right? Well, no, not really, because it wasn't a specific operate, or at least from the public documents that we have access to, it wasn't a specific operation there was just an understanding from some of the earliest days of the CIA that it would be beneficial to have people under journalistic cover. Specifically, uh, Alan Dulles started to uh, formulate that ideas, uh, uh, that idea in the early 1950s when he took over the directorship, and it was implemented in various ways over the years. And we know this again because of the work of people like Carl Bernstein. Whatever else may be said about Carl Bernstein and his reporting, at any rate. Uh, he had the landmark, I believe it was 1977, Rolling Stone article, The CIA and the Media, in which he exhaustively documented a lot of these connections. Of course, I'll put the link in the show notes uh, for people who want to read that in its entirety. But, um, well, I won't say long story short, but at least the entree to that story. Some of these journalists' relationships, talking about some of the relation, uh, journalists involved in uh, with the agency, were tacit. Some were explicit. There was cooperation, accommodation, and overlap. Journalists provided a full range of clandestine services, from simple intelligence gathering to serving as go-betweens with spies in communist countries. Reporters shared their notebooks with the CIA. Editors shared their staffs. 
Some of the journalists were Pulitzer Prize winners, distinguished reporters who considered themselves ambassadors without portfolio for their country. Most were less exalted. Foreign correspondents who found that their association with the agency helped their work. Stringers and freelancers who were as interested in, in the daring in the daring do of the spy business as in filing articles. And the smallest category, full-time CIA employees masquerading as journalists abroad. In many instances, CIA documents show journalists were engaged to perform tasks for the CIA with the consent of the management America's the managements of America's leading news organization. Sorry for the spell, uh, typos in there, but I, I trust you get the idea. And again, I think this is important to note. It's not necessarily that this was a specific operation to directly implant C CIA agents, actual CIA operatives in the role of journalists. There was some of that. And he does talk about that in the article, but it was a much more broad ranging under the table and over the table, wink in the nod. And you share your book with us here and you, you put this piece of information there. It's not necessarily that we're going to find the, the document treasure trove of the uh, annals of this particular project, because again, this worked on a lot of human to human relationship levels. And what kinds of relationships? I mean, who was involved in this? Who is specifically fingered by Bernstein as being active, complicit um, members of this operation or this, this phenomenon? Oh, people like Bill Paley, who had an active, ongoing, working relationship with Alan Dulles. And as Bernstein writes in CIA and the media, he, uh, CBS was undoubtedly the CIA's most uh, cooperative and most important television media asset at that time. Um, Henry Luce, who had not just a working relationship, but an active friendship with Alan Dulles and who was happy to employ the resources of time in the service of the CIA. Uh, Arthur Hayes Sulzberger, the publisher of the New York Times, who again had an, uh, had certainly used the Times and was allowed the Times to be used to seed information um, that was uh, friendly to the CIA. There were underlings under him who had more of an active part in that relationship, at least according to Bernstein, but Sulzberger was aware and complicit. So this happened and thank, uh, thank goodness it's over, right? I mean, this doesn't happen anymore because this all happened and it was exposed in the church committee and the family jewels and all that, and it's done, right? I mean, could you imagine if, say, the ex-director of the CIA was currently a contributor to MSNBC. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? Or could you imagine if a former FBI, a, FBI agent was now an active national security contributor to NBC News? Or if the former FBI special agent was now the CNN political analyst or a former Homeland Security official was a CNN national security analyst or a former DEA administrator, administrator was an MSNBC legal and political analyst with his own podcast. Check it out, folks. Or James Baker, former FBI general counsel, if he was a CNN legal analyst. Or if Francis Townsend, the former Homeland Security agent, ad, advisor for George W. Bush, was now CBS News senior security and law enforcement analyst. Or if a retired CIA chief of Russia operations was a CNN national security analyst, or if the retired FBI supervisory special agent James Gagliano was now the CBS News security and law enforcement analyst, or if Philip Mudd, the former CIA counterterrorism official, was now the CNN counterterrorism analyst. That would be crazy, wouldn't it, guys? Oh, yeah. Okay. It is crazy. Yeah. But in a way, maybe this even speaks to the propaganda model, because in this case, I mean, when we talk about CIA and the media and Bernstein and those revelations and Paley and those kinds of people working behind the scenes, essentially, with the agency, at least that was behind the scenes. I mean, that was conspiracy. But this, this is out in the open. I mean, no one's denying that Philip Mudd was the former CIA counterterrorism official who is now a CNN counterterrorism analyst or any of those other things. That's all part of their public biography. And most people don't care. I, I find that interesting. That's a sort of moving on in this relationship, isn't it? Um, to the point where now, of course, as I'm sure you've seen in the last several years of topsy-turvy, up is down, black is white, cats marrying dogs. Now, now, hey, the FBI and the CIA are trusted sources of news and information because they're against that Trump guy or whatever. It's been a crazy ride in the last few years. And again, maybe that speaks to the, uh, the propaganda model that uh, Chomsky and Herman were forwarding. You don't need the under the table hidden conspiracy in the smoky back room 
it's just the way it works. And no one thinks to question it. Who else are you going to be to get as your counterterrorism analyst other than a former counterterrorism official? I mean, there is a logic to that, isn't there? So why not? Anyway, I think it's important to um, at least note that that took place, is taking place, continues to take place, will presumably always take place as long as these media organizations exist in the form that they do. All right. Once again, that was a small sampling of just a couple of pieces from Lesson 2 on TV as a Weapon, which, as I say, covered a, 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 essentially the 20th century and the rise of electronic media in its various forms, first uh, commercial radio and commercial television, the corporatization of media, the consolidation of the media oligopoly and how it functioned and some of the main players in that oligopoly, etc., covered in great detail in Lesson 2, which ends by leaving us on the doorstep of the 21st century and what I call the zenith of TV. And I note in that in that lesson, I note specifically that you could think of 9-11 uh, itself as sort of one of those, in the same way World War I was the zenith of print and everyone was receiving their news and information from newspapers and printed matter very shortly to be eclipsed by radio and then television. Well, in the 21st century, at 9-11, Almost everyone receiving most of their information through electronic media of various kinds, some printed matter, of course, people still reading newspapers. I mean, obviously this coexists, but I think television being the primary cultural dominant force at that point in 2001. And I remember from my own story on 9-11 sitting there at my job trying to figure out what was going on. Somebody had a radio on in the background. They were listening to the updates. Someone else came in uh, who had been watching what was happening on TV and telling us about that. And here I was stuck at my desk trying to figure out what the hell's going on and trying to go to the old iteration of CNN.com, which was the server was going down because too many people were trying to access it. it when I got it, it was just uh, it was web 1.0 kind of n just static page, very little information, and certainly not the way to get information. Yes, the, the web existed, the internet certainly existed in 2001, but it wasn't the primary way people were receiving their information about the world yet. Fast forward just a few years, and it certainly is the way that most people are receiving most of their information most of the time. A number of asterisks involved there. But so that is where we step into, of course, with lesson three, caught in the web, which from that title, I think you get a tenor of the the perspective, the analysis that goes on in this lesson. And as you'll note, it, note when you take the course that as you progress through the lessons, it gets more and more philosophical and more and more to the heart of what is media and what is mediated reality and how do we interact with that and how does that change us? How does these media technologies, not, not how do we use them as tools, how do they use us? And does the media technology itself start to shape our society? And what is the implication of that? There's some very deep philosophical things that clearly start to, I think, come to a head in Lesson 3 as I go through the online visionaries who foresaw the online revolution, what that online revolution was, the way it was portrayed to the public, the information superhighway, the democratization of information versus the darker history of not only the military, but also the intelligence agency origins of internet and databases and things of that sort the big surveillance dragnet view of internet history, which um, is oft neglected. I go through that and start talking about the development of online media and how that shapes, for example, the way that news is presented and and taken in and uh, the, the, the tension between this in incredible and undeniable explosion in communication and information that has taken place over the past couple of decades the primary example of which, from my perspective, is the fact that you are sitting there right now listening to my voice, wherever you happen to be at this precise moment. That in and of itself will never not be mind-blowing to me, because even a couple of decades ago, I couldn't... It's not that I wouldn't have seen myself being a pod... I couldn't have seen myself being a podcaster for a living. What is a podcast? And how do you do that for a living? And why would I be doing this? And and why would people be listening to me? And how does any of this work? And how, how can I make a living doing that? that? None of this makes any sense. Well, here we are, and it is happening. There has been an incredible change in the past couple of decades that has 
I, I'm sure influenced all of our lives, but obviously my my own case study is is a walking example of how someone who had no interest in ever being a media figure of any sort is now podcasting for a living. What does that mean? How does that happen? This incredible explosion of information, but with it comes the dark side of the web, the web that everyone is being caught in. So I go through the that that tension and what that means, and as we start to place more and more and more of our lives in mediated reality, what does that mean about re- the real world, about re- reality itself, about hyper-reality, simulacra, simulations, uh, you better believe I get into Baudrillard and start talking about the, the meaty philosophical stuff, and I try to break it down to brass tacks. What is, this, what is this actually going to look like? So at a certain point in Lesson 3, I break down what, what is the next iteration of this media technology that's coming along? What is this metaverse that people are talking about? And what, what will that actually mean? What will that look like in our day-to-day lives? All right, I hope I don't need to introduce this too thoroughly at this point, because I'm sure you've all at least heard about this. But yes, um, Facebook, for example, is no longer Facebook. It's the Meta Group Inc. or whatever they're calling themselves, um, investing more of their capital in helping to build out the metaverse. And what is the metaverse? I I say it's the matrix. (laughs) I mean, this is where it's going, right? It's this wonderful space. It'll be the 3D representation of space that you can go into in your VR goggles or whatever the next iteration of this technology is. You'll be able to go in and interact with avatars of real people or created simulated people or whatever it is and do things and buy things online. And you could buy virtual things with actual physical cash in the real world, or you can buy um, physical things with virtual cash in the online world, or it'll all start to merge and become this sort of mixture. And where will the simulation end? Where will the metaverse end and reality begin? It will start to get confused. And that might sound like You know, what does that really mean? Ah, whatever. I don't think it. I I found an interesting image representation of what that universe could look like that I'd like to share with you. Tómate si quieres una buena calificación. Voy lo más rápido que puedo. ¿Has pensado en correr? Es saludable y eficiente. Seguro que no hay más trabajos disponibles. Estudié para ser profesora y estoy haciendo mercados. Y además puedes quedarte con los puntos de fidelización. Eres una monte afortunada. Tienes que confiar en la aplicación. Te sientes inspirada. Gracias. Chao. ¿Quién soy yo? No, no es lo que quiero decir. ¿Para dónde voy? No, puedo volver a empezar. Volví al... Okay, I will make it stop, but I actually want to show one specific scene where where something happens to this virtual hyper-reality. Buen día, Emilio. ¿Qué puedo hacer por usted? 
¿Qué está pasando? Mis puntos están bien. No se preocupe, sus puntos están seguros conmigo. ¿Le puedo ayudar en algo más, Emilio? Yo no soy Emilio, yo soy Juliana Restrepo. Por favor, espero. Hola, Juliana Restrepo. Me alegra verte. ¿Qué puedo hacer por ti? Mis puntos están bien. ¿Qué está pasando? Tranquila, todo está bien. Parece que alguien está intentando vulnerar su cuenta. Por favor, espere que reinicio su dispositivo. Ah. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. This is a uh, slightly longer. It goes on for another couple minutes. But I want you to sit with that for a moment because I think we all know this is where it's heading. This is what they are going to attempt to bring about. And think of that moment where the screen and all of the stuff drops out and, well, there's reality, right? Oh, it's kind of boring, humdrum, mundane. There's just people walking around in a supermarket. Well, where's all the music? Where's the lights? Where's the stuff? You know, you start to immerse yourself in that to the point where reality doesn't even seem real anymore. It's just, uh, it's just this. We know it is heading in this. We know it is heading in this direction. Don't worry. Of course, I will put the link in the course notes. And I really suggest immersing yourself in this video if you're going to watch it. It's six minutes long. Just find a space where you can just sit there and focus on the video because that moment where the hyper reality drops out and you're left with reality is really quite a profound moment when it happens. And I think we need to inoculate ourselves against this because it will, of course, come a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time until we start to get more and more into this web that is being constructed. And until before you know it, we lose ourselves. We lose our humanity. If you are anything like me, I trust that you are starting to understand and appreciate the depth and importance of this topic. And perhaps you are starting to understand why I have spent so much time preparing for the course originally as it took place last, uh, last October, November, and why I've spent so much time preparing this and getting it ready uh, for you in this format, because I truly think this is exceptionally important subject matter. In fact, this will be one of the defining, uh, defining aspects of our lives and of human civilization itself going forward into the 21st century. What will our relationship be to these media technologies that are creating this entirely, entirely synthetic, partially synthetic, simulacrum of the real world that starts to replace the real world. As I say, I think this is absolutely important stuff. We have to know where we came from in order to understand where we are, in order to understand where we could be going or where we should be going. And that's, I think, really the operative question in all of this and perhaps the reason why we study history in the first place, in order to better understand who we are and where we've come from and more importantly, where we can and should go from here. So I hope, again, we've just skimmed the surface of a couple of clips from this six and a half hour lecture series. So I think, again, you might start to get a sense of what this is like, but you, uh, trust me, there's a lot of detailed information in this course. So if you are interested, it is available right now. You could start downloading it today at newworldnextweek.com. It is available for purchase for $50, but with all of my media downloads, subscribers to the Corbett Report do get to use their subscriber discount code so you can get 25% off the purchase price by entering the subscriber discount code, which is at the bottom of every single subscriber newsletter. As always, I always say, because there's always some subscribers out there who are subscribing to The Corbett Report, our monthly or yearly subscribers who do pay, who don't know how to access the newsletter or don't know where the subscriber discount code is. If that's the case, just contact me through the contact form. I will be happy to walk you through that so that you can get that discount code. But anyway, I hope you will avail yourselves of it. I think this is an important course. I put a lot of effort and energy into it, as you will see. And I am 100% confident that once you take the course, you will understand 
the importance of this information and how much information is in it. It's the chicken and egg question, though. How do I get you to understand that without going through the six and a half hours? Anyway, I've done my best today. But if that's not enough, wait, there's more. Yes, I have also been working on a new documentary, a documentary project on this very subject, this subject matter. It is called The Media Matrix, and it will be coming out in installments over the next three weeks at CorbettReport.com. So starting next week with part one of The Media Matrix documentary, you're going to see some of the core information and ideas that are contained in this six-hour lecture series condensed down into a documentary format. And it's not like any of my other documentaries, I would say. I would say it's a slightly different entity altogether. And it's... Anyway, you'll see it when you see it, and I hope you can appreciate it. Um, I'm very excited about this. Again, I think this is incredibly important subject matter. So I will be circling back to this and making a documentary that I'm releasing free to the public over the next three weeks and talking about this more in the future um, because I think this is one of the defining aspects of our future. Anyway, all that being said, Mass Media, A History, the online course, three-lesson online course, is now available at newworldnextweek.com. I hope you will check it out. That being said, I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com and I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the very near future.